Hello, my dear students and the rest of the learners. Welcome to this presentation in which we are going to learn about the topic Introduction to Operating Systems, part one. This video will continue in the next video by the same title, Introduction to Operating Systems, part two. My name is Meme JM, or you can call me Emily Swap, and I run a YouTube channel by the name Emily Swap ICT, in which I cover various topics on issues concerning computers and ICT. In this presentation, we are going to learn on meaning and the importance of operating systems, the parts of operating systems, concepts of operating systems, the characteristics of operating systems, objectives or goals of operating systems, and the functions of operating systems. Meaning and importance. Now, an operating system is a software that controls, supervises, directs, and manages all the operations of a computer and acts as an interface between the applications and the hardware. It is the program or a set of programs that directs a computer's operations, controlling and scheduling the execution of other programs and managing the storage, the input, and the output devices or resources and all other communication resources. Simply put, when we talk about operating systems in computing or in the front of computers, we are simply referring to that program or sets of programs that controls, supervises, directs, and manages all the operations of a computer, as well as controlling all what a person does using a computer. It is therefore this software that is in charge of all the computer resources, as well as being in charge of how those resources are used. That's why we are saying that it is the operating system that directs a computer's operations. In other words, it is the operating system's software that directs the various parts or components of a computer on what they should do, when they should do it, and even on how they should do it. It involves itself in the function of controlling how these resources are used and at what time by scheduling the various programs. In other words, when a person is using a computer, this person may be using various programs to carry out various activities. And therefore, it is the duty or the work of the operating systems to ensure that each of these programs is given its own turn to be able to make its own requests and also take control of various hardware at certain times. It is the same software that is in charge of managing how the storage a medium is used. So whenever the user wants to store any type of data or any type of information or even instructions, those instructions need to be stored in a certain storage medium. And therefore, it is the work of the operating systems to manage how that storage space is used. It is the same operating systems that is in charge of controlling how input is done and even how output is gotten from the computer. Similarly, it is the operating systems that is in charge of ensuring that one resource is able to communicate with another resource as required by the user. And therefore, when we are talking about operating system software, it is important to remember that this is a core system software. Without this system software, 
there is nothing that a computer can be able to do. It is therefore like a mandatory software. It is the first software that you must install in your computer in order to make that computer to be functional. It is installed on the hard drive and it enables the computer hardware to communicate and operate with the computer software. In other words, it is the operating system that also controls how the rest of the software are able to interact with the hardware. Therefore, once a new computer is purchased, the first program that is installed in it in order to enable that hardware or that computer to function as well as enable other programs to be used is the installation of the operating system. So once you purchase a new computer, you have to install an operating system into it so that it gives a platform on installation of other programs. And also, once that is done, it enables all the devices that are connected into this computer to be able to function. So what are some of the examples of operating systems that you can purchase and install in your computer? My dear students and the rest of the listeners and learners, it is important to note that there are very many types of operating systems that are in use today, but there are those which are common. So some examples of these operating systems include Linux, Microsoft Windows, various series running from 98, 2000, XP, Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10. And we also have another one which is very current that is being called Windows 11. We also have Unix, we have MS-DOS, we have OS Talk 2, OS X, VMS, Mac OS, OS Stroke 400, AIX, Zen Stroke OS, Android, amongst others. However, the most common operating systems that is commonly found in a number of the computers in use today, especially the personal computers, is mostly the Windows operating system and especially the most recent ones like Windows 10 and Windows 11. Also, for the portable devices, like the smartphones, most of them or majority of them are making use of the operating system that is called Android. It is important to note that various operating systems are used by various users based on what they do. For example, most of the users that make use of their computers most of the time to create drawings, diagrams, and those other kind of diagrammatical representations, they mostly prefer Macintosh or what we call Mac OS. And of course, the Android operating systems is very much uh, applicable in the portable devices, small portable devices, and especially the smartphones and other related devices. And therefore, depending with the kind of operation that you want your computer to be performing, that is what will make you uh, choose amongst the existing operating systems. So when you turn on your computer, the operating system runs and checks to ensure that all the parts of the computer are functioning properly. Then once loaded, it manages all the activities of the computer and interacts with the input and output devices. This means that once you have installed an operating system in a computer, once you boot that device or you switch on that device, during the process of booting, the operating system executes various activities. One of them, it checks to ensure that all the basic requirements all the basic devices that are needed to make that computer or that device work effectively are available. And in case it finds out there's something which is missing, this operating system will alert the user. Once a computer is turned on, the operating system remains in memory until you turn the computer 
off. This means that once you have installed an operating system in the computer, anytime you boot that computer or you boot that device, one of the activities that takes place is the transfer or the movement or a copy of a certain portion of the operating system that is stored in the main memory. So during the time when you are making use of that computer or that device, there is a section or a portion of the operating system that remains in your device's memory for the purposes of being used during the time when you are using that device. So as you continue making use of that device, various parts or portions or programs that compose the operating system are brought in to the main memory. And once the purpose or the function that those programs or parts were supposed to perform is over, they are taken back to the storage. So it is very important to note that once booting process is complete, one of the programs that are brought into your device's main memory is the operating system. But once you turn off that device or you switch off that device, that portion of, main, of the operating systems that have been stored in main memory is transferred back to the storage. We are going to look more on this in a video by the title Memory Management. So without a computer operating system, the computer hardware and software would be useless. Simply, what I mean is, even if you have very good hardware and you have very nice software installed in your computer, without an operating system, that hardware will not function and that software will not function. And in fact, you cannot be able to install any software in a computer if that computer has not been already installed with an operating system. So if an operating system program or software is missing, that it simply means that there is no hardware, no software that is going to function. So if you want your computer to function or you want your device to function and you want any other device that are going to connect to it to function, or if you want any software to perform its task in a computer, then you must ensure that you have installed the relevant operating system way in advance. And therefore, the operating system is very important because it is the one that provides a software platform on top of which other programs that we call the application programs can run. This means even if you have very nice application programs, programs to play songs, programs for music, programs for videos, programs that perform any other function. If you want those programs to function and you want to use your computer to perform various tasks as defined in those application programs, then you must install an operating system that will act as a platform to allow these programs to be installed. And it is the same one that will also make these other programs to function. Therefore, the five main reasons as to why operating systems were developed include, number one, to increase the throughput of the system or of the computer. Throughput is that amount of data that is processed within a given time. So if we say that a system has high throughput and another one has low throughput, we are simply saying that this device or this computer is able to perform or to process huge or voluminous or huge quantities of data within a very short time. So a system that has high throughput is one that is able to process huge amounts of data within a very short time. While the opposite is correct. If a system has low throughput, it simply means that it can only be able to process very little amount of data within a certain duration of time. Therefore, the operating systems were developed in order to increase the amount of work that can be done by the users within a very short time. The second reason was to improve communication between the user and the computer. This simply means 
just as I've said, the user or a person cannot be able to speak to a hardware. Even if you pick a hardware, for example, the speakers, and you speak to them using your natural voice, like you tell it, hello, it will not be able to respond because the speaker is not a living organism, nor can it be able to understand the language being used by the people. And therefore, for the speaker, to be able or the speakers to be able to give the required response from the user the user needs to communicate to the speakers through an operating system so the operating systems was developed in order to enable the users to be able to have a way in which to communicate to the computer and its various parts this means that a user does not directly speak or interact with the hardware, but the user interacts with the hardware through uh, operating systems, as we are going to see later. The third reason was to decrease job setup time. That simply means to reduce the amount of time that it takes for a person to be able to set up the processes for processing data. So with the operating systems, the speed of putting proper uh, procedures, the speed at which the various activities are organized so that they can be processed by the computer is usually very low. So within a very short time, the user is able to start getting output from a system. So the operating system reduces the amount of time that would have been used by the users while processing or while putting up processes or procedures for performing a certain task. How does it do this? It does this because these processes or these uh, steps are already written in form of a program. And therefore the operating systems is able to pick these programs or this program within a very short time, do the interpretation and execute the task as required by the user. The other reason was to decrease downtime. In other words, the other reason as to why the operating system was developed is to ensure that the system does not collapse very fast. It does not stop function. So with an operating system, the user is able to continuously make use of a computer without that computer getting tired or breaking down. Then the other reason was to increase the performance. Of course, an operating system is able to instruct the hardware to perform work. And remember, a human being can get tired while performing a certain activity. After the person has been able to perform certain kind of uh, work continuously, it reaches a time when this person gets tired and he or she slows down in his or her response or in his or her way of executing or performing the job. But with an operating system, the hardware will not get tired. The operating system does not get tired and therefore the output will continue increasing. In other words, when you compare the hardware performing work and a person performing the same work, the amount of work that a computer can be able to do in comparison to what a person can be able to do is very high. The hardware can do more work than what a human being can do because the hardware does not get tired, but a human being will get tired. And therefore, the other reason as to why the operating systems were developed was to increase the system's performance. So the primary objective of an operating system is to make the computer system convenient to use and to utilize computer hardware in an efficient manner. The operating system performs the basic tasks, such as receiving the input from the user through the keyboard, then processing those instructions, that is converting them into a form that can be understood by the hardware and sending output to the screen. In other words, the operating system performs the tasks of receiving the input from the user, which can either be data or instructions through the keyboard. Then it carries out processing of those instructions and that data which is received, and it gives out the required output through the screen or through other means that we are going to learn in subsequent presentations. For hardware functions, such as input and output and memory allocation, the operating system acts as an intermediary or a bridge between the programs and the computer hardware. 
Although the application code is usually executed directly by the hardware and frequently next system calls to an operating system function or is interrupted by it. This simply means that the operating system receives instructions from the user through an, a certain application program, and then it is able to interpret those instructions received from the operating from the application programs into a form that can be understood by the hardware. And therefore, the operating system acts as an intermediary between the application program that the user is using and the hardware. That's in the same way. If, for example, you are from Eru and you only know Kimeru, mother tongue, and then you meet with a European for the very first time who speaks in English, you who is only aware of Kimeru cannot be able to speak directly to a European because you will not be able to understand English and the European or this person from Europe will not be able to understand your Kimeru. And therefore you need an intermediary. Let me call him or her an interpreter. You need somebody who understands both languages, the Kimeru and the English that this other person is using. So when you speak in mother tongue, in Kimeru, this person will interpret it or translate it to English. When this European speaks, or this person who is only aware of English speaks, this person who knows both English and Kimeru will be able to interpret what this English person has sent, or this European person has sent, to a language that the person who understands Kimeru only can be able to understand. That is the same thing that happens when users are making use of a computer. An operating system has to stand in between them. It has to stand in between them so that it is able to interpret what the user wants to say through an application program and put it in a form that the hardware will be able to understand. And then when the hardware gives any feedback, the operating system will do the interpretation and convey the required message to the user through a certain application program. So the operating system plays a very key role in the use of all a bridge between the programs and the hardware. So the following two diagrams illustrate how users and the processes access the computer's resources through the operating system because an operating system is basically an intermediary agent between the user and the computer hardware. It therefore illustrates how a user interacts with the hardware using a hierarchical structure. My dear students, when you look at this diagram keenly, you'll be able to see that we have on the upper layer, we have the users. You can see we have users and we have several users. We have several users. And then below the users, below these users, that is user one, user two, user n, and meaning any other user. Now this user or each of these users is interacting with a certain program. Let me say, for example, you want to play a song and the song is already installed in your computer. So what you need to do as the user, you require a program for playing a song. So those set of programs that will play certain roles in ensuring that the song is played, forms what we call the software. And therefore, each user has to interact with a certain program. Each user has to interact with a certain program. Some of these programs, as you can see, are application software. And these ones, the, the types of software, and the more details of software, are covered in my other video by the title computer software and installation. So my dear students and listeners, if you want to get detailed explanation about software in general, whether system software or application software, visit the other video in my YouTube channel, MLSWAP ICT, by the name um, Computer Softwares and Installation. And from there, you'll be able to understand more. But for the sake of this presentation on operating systems, my main um, objective is to ensure that you are able to comprehend or understand 
but as a user, you require a program to be able to interact with the computer. And I'm giving an example of a song. If you have a song that you want to play, your computer, your device must have a program that can be able to play a song. An example of such a program, for example, would be Windows Media or Windows Media Player or any other type of a program. So you must have a program to use. Now, this program, if it is being used to perform a certain task by you directly as a person, it is called an application software. But if you're interacting with a software, like for example, Windows Media Player, which is part of an operating system, then Windows Media Player becomes a system software. So in nutshell, as a user, for you to be able to use any computer, you must have already installed in that computer a program for the purpose that you want. But your program, your system software or application software that you have installed cannot be able to do what you want if there is no operating system. So if you have a song as a user, let me say, take an example of user two. If user two has a song that he or she wants to play using Windows Media Player, which in this case, I can verify to be part of a system software, to be part of Windows operating system, then this user must also ensure that the device that he or she is going to use as an operating system. It is this operating system, like for example, Windows operating system, that will be able to receive the instruction of playing a song from the user through a program for playing the song. And when this operating system receives that request, the operating system will check and find out whether this device that the person wants to use to play music contains the required devices for playing music. So the operating system will check and find out whether, number one, the song is already in existence and the song is stored in a storage medium. So if this operating system finds out that the song is missing, it will give an alert to the user. So the operating system will speak through the program that the person is using to play the song and generate a message that the song is not found or that there is an error. And the user then will be able to know that the program or the song that he or she wants to play is not available. Secondly, the operating system will find out whether this device has adequate memory in which to hold the song while it's going to be played. If the memory is not available, even if the file or the song is available, that song will not be played. The reason being the operating system has established that there is no adequate memory in the device to hold the song during the time when the person is playing. In addition, the operating system will find out whether the processor is available. The processor is supposed to be there, like in this case, to be able to convert that file which contains a song to audio, to um, audio information that can be relayed through speakers. In addition, this program, the operating system will try to find out whether speakers are available, otherwise the song will not be played. So if there are no speakers through which the song can be uh, uh, played, the person will not even be able to hear. So the operating system will find out whether the required devices are available. And if those devices are available, that is the hardware is available, then the operating system will perform the instruction that it has received through an application software or in other software. And it will do what the user requested and the user will be finally happy. So what does this mean? These diagrams illustrate how the interactions take place. So the user interacts with a program, then that program interacts with an operating system and the operating system interacts with the hardware. And therefore on the outermost layer, we have users. Then next users, we have software. The software that the users will be using to give instructions. And after the hardware we have, after the software, we have hardware. 
So users are in the outer layer, then software is in the next level, and hardware is usually found at the lowest level. Similarly, this diagram here illustrates the users. So the user issues an instruction. The instruction is received by an application program. The application program sends the request to an operating system. The operating system communicates with the relevant hardware. Then the hardware gives its feedback to the operating system. The operating system sends the feedback it has received from the hardware to the application program that the user is using and the application program gives the final feedback to the user. Good. That's how an operating system interacts with, uh, that's, that, that's how, or that's how important the operating systems are in as far as the use of a computer is concerned. In addition, what I have already explained can be illustrated using another diagram that we call learned approach. The other one, we have used a structure. Now this one, we are demonstrating the same uh, facts, but now using what we call layered approach or architecture. In this architecture, we use a circular representation to indicate how the interactions take place. So just as I've said in the other one, the users in this case are on the outer layer. Outer layer is this layer outside here, where you and me are. Now, if we want to perform any task with a computer, we need to have the relevant software or programs, as I have said. So the programs forms the second layer, this layer, which I'm highlighting here. This is the second layer. So under the second layer, we have various types of programs. Examples, compilers, a.out, date, grep, cd, vi, applications, and the others. So those are the software that we can have. And then below the application layer, and remember I've said this is the application layer, the layer that contains the programs that you are using as a user to perform various tasks. Then below the application programs, we have another layer, this layer, which is composed of the shell and the kernel. So the shell is the outermost part of operating system. So from the application layer, the second layer or the next layer, which we are calling the shell layer and the kernel layer, both of them are a part of operating systems. But the layer, the part of the operating system, which directly interacts with the application program and it also interacts with the kernel is called the shell. So the shell layer is the layer that acts as an intermediary between the application programs and the innermost part of the operating system that is called the kernel. So when you issue an instruction as a user using a certain program, those instructions from the program are received by the part of operating system that we call the shell. And then the shell that is able to understand language received from the application program is able to convert those instructions to a form that can be understood by the lowest layer of operating system, which is the kernel. And therefore, the kernel is like the call. It is the innermost part of operating system. It is very primitive. What I mean by primitive is it is the only part that can be able to convert instructions received from the shell and put them into form of electrical signals on and off that the hardware is able to understand. And therefore, kernel is the innermost layer. And then on the lowest layer, on the lowest end, we have the hardware. So on the outer layer, we have users. On the next layer, we have application programs. The next level, we have the shell, which is one part of the outermost part of OS. Then we have the kernel, which is the innermost part of OS. And it is the kernel that communicates with the hardware, my dear students and other listeners. Good. 
having understood what an operating system is and how it interacts, then the next thing we need to ask ourselves is what is the function of each of these layers that we have looked at? We have looked at the users, we have looked at application layer, shell, kernel, and we have talked about the hardware. So the hardware layer consists of all the peripheral devices or all the devices that we make use of. And those devices that you connect to a computer are upon the peripheral devices. Then the kernel layer, it is the core component of operating system. It interacts directly with the hardware, just as I have said, and it provides low level services to upper layer components. What we mean by low level services are those services that the kernel performs in interacting with the hardware and giving a response to the shell. Then the shell layer, is an, the shell is an interface to kernel. It hides the complexity of kernel's functions from the users. What this means is that it is not your work as a user to know how the hardware is able to receive instruction and perform what you have requested. So that work is complicated and it is carried out by the uh, kernel. And therefore, the shell hides that. It hides those complexities of what is happening from the users. So the shell takes commands from the user and executes kernel's functions. Remember I've said that the shell is the link between the kernel and the users or the application programs that the users are using. And of course, as part of these programs is what we call the utilities. Utility programs provide the user with the most of the functionalities of an operating system. For example, saving, if you want to save something, it is a work of utility software to save, copy, and perform those other routine activities. So what are the parts of operating systems? I have already said that the two main parts of an operating system are the shell and the kernel. My dear students and learners, it is important to note that just as a reminder, when you hear of an operating system, you are talking about a program, a set of programs. And therefore, when I talk about parts of operating systems, it's important for you to note that it is part of the many programs that make up an operating system. So the operating system is made up of two major programs. These are control programs that manage the computer's hardware and the resources by performing some major functions. The other name of these control programs, all of them put together, whose mandate is to interact with the hardware directly is the kernel. While the second set of programs are the service programs which provide a service to the user or a programmer of the computer system. Now, this, these service programs are generally referred to as the shell or they form the part of operating system that we call the shell. It is therefore important for you to remember, my dear students and listeners, that when we talk about the kernel, we are simply referring to the control programs that manage the computer hardware. And of course, they form the innermost part of operating systems. Well, when we talk about service programs or when we talk about the shell, we are referring to those service programs put together that provide the service to the user or the programmer of the computer system. Therefore, the above two programs forms the two main parts of an operating system, which are the shell and the kernel. These body parts are used for performing any operation of the system. So let's look at the shell. It is also called an interpreter because it translates the user's request commands into machine language and then transfers the request to the kernel. Simply put, just as I've said, the shell receives instructions from the user through an application program. So this application program sends those instructions to the shell. This shell, remember you're saying shell is service programs. They interpret, they interpret the instruction received into a form that is able to be understood by the kernel, which is the innermost part of OS. And these instructions are therefore converted into what we call machine language. For you to know more about what machine language is, I would advise that you look for another video posted in my YouTube channel, MLSWAP ICT, by the name or the title, Elementary Programming Principles, or Introduction to Programming, where you'll be able to learn more about machine language. Therefore, 
Once the shell receives the instructions from an application program, it interprets them by putting them into what we call machine language. And then the shell transfers those instructions that in machine language to the kernel. So user protected mode of a kernel is the mode in which user programs and other system programs works. In this mode, these programs have no access to system hardware and the kernel code. Support code, which is not required to run in kernel mode, is usually found in what we call system library. User programs or utilities use system libraries to access kernel functions to get systems low level tasks. When I talk about systems low level tasks, I'm referring to those tasks that are performed by the hardware inside there, inside the hardware itself, that is of no interest to the user. And therefore, the user or the application programs do not directly interact with the hardware, nor do they interact directly with the kernel. And therefore, the, 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 the function and they operate under the level that we call user protected mode or user mode or the co-protected mode of the kernel. Application programs or applications operate within the protected mode and they can only use hardware by communicating with the kernel, which controls everything in supervisor mode. A user program may leave protected mode only by triggering an interrupt, causing control to be passed back to the kernel. My dear students, I will also further explain more about the issue of the interrupts and our process management videos. So kindly check on process management videos to be able to understand more about the use of interrupts. But it's important for you to remember that a user program may leave protected mode only by triggering an interrupt that means making a certain request, causing control to be passed back to the kernel. What is a kernel? It is also called the heart or the core of the operating system. Why? Because every operation is performed by using it. Remember, any request that a user makes will require use of hardware. It requires some hardware to perform a certain task. And the only part of operating system that can be able to pass that instruction to the hardware is the kernel. So the kernel is the heart or the core of the operating system. This is the part which is loaded into memory. Immediately you boot your computer. And in fact, it even controls the booting process. So kernel is loaded into memory life at system initialization and it contains many procedures needed to ensure that the system operates. It consists of four main parts. The manager tasks or processes, the memory manager, the file manager, and IO device manager. The manager tasks or process manager is in charge of programs that are in execution. The memory manager is in charge of handling any issue to do with storage. File manager is in charge of any activity to do with what the user has stored in a certain location that we call a file. Input output device manager is in charge of handling all the requests and activities that are carried out by the input devices as well as the output devices. When the kernel receives the request from the shell, then this will process the request and display the results on the screen. So the kernel mode is also called the supervisor mode. Now this, my dear, my dear students and listeners, it simply tells you that when we talk about the parts of operating systems, we are referring to the user mode and the supervisor mode. The user mode is the one we have talked about, the shell. So the user mode is the level at which the user is able or programs are able to interact with the kernel. And that level is the shell. So the shell, whatever that takes place there, takes place in what we call the user mode or the protected mode. Whatever that takes place within the kernel takes place under the mode that we call the supervisor mode. This is a special privileged mode in which the kernel component code executes with the full access to all the resources of the computer. In other words, this is the mode in which all the devices are handled. This mode is used by the operating system's kernel for low-level tasks that need unrestricted access to hardware, such as controlling how memory is written and erased and the communication with the devices. The kernel runs each process and it provides system services to processes. It provides protected access to hardware and to processes. With the aid of the firmware and device drivers, 
the kernel provides the most basic level of control over all of the computer's hardware devices. My dear students and listeners, when I talk about the firmware and device drivers, kindly remember that these are a part of the kernel. Whenever you install a new driver into your computer, it becomes part and parcel of the operating system and it forms the specific part of operating system that we call the kernel. So device drivers and firmware are a part of the operating system. The kernel therefore manages memory access for programs in the RAM. It determines which programs get access to which hardware resources. It sets up or resets the CPU's operating states for optimal operation at all times. It organizes the data for long-term non-volatile storage with file system on such media as disks, tapes, flash memory, etc. So what are some of the concepts or terms that we're about to find when we're talking about the operating systems? One of them is processes. Whenever you hear a process, a process is basically a program in execution or a program that is what we call the running state. The execution of a process must progress in a sequential fashion. It is important to note that a process is not a program, but it's just only an instant of a program in execution. Very key. My dear students, you should be able to differentiate between a process and a program. A program is a set of instructions that tells a hardware what to do and how to do it. And these instructions are in a, in a certain storage medium or in a storage medium. But for you to be able, or for, the, or for the computer to be able to perform or execute those instructions that are in that program, those set of instructions must be loaded into memory. So once that copy of that program or set of instructions are transferred to RAM, and they are also transferred to the central processing unit for processing, that is no longer a program, but it becomes a process. So when you start a program, it becomes a process. But when the processing is over, when the conversion process is over, or when you will be using that set of instructions that are in execution, which you are calling a process, they are stored back to where they came from in a storage medium or a certain memory as a program. So associated with each process is the address space. That means once you start a program, it has to be given an address space, a list of memory locations where it will be kept during processing. And this can be from zero to some maximum which the process can be able to read and write. The address space contains executable program. The program's data and is stack. In other words, the address space or the space which is assigned to a process during execution, that space not only does it contain the instructions that are being processed at the process itself, but it also contains the data that that process will require during execution and it's stack, that is the addresses the addresses of various sections of memory that will contain anything that relates to it. Also associated with each process is a set of resources, commonly including resources such as registers. This includes the program counter and stack pointer, a list of open files, outstanding alarms, list of related processes, and all other information needed to run the program. A process is fundamentally a container. A process is fundamentally a container that holds all the information needed to run a program. So the five major activities of an operating system in regard to process management are, number one, creation and deletion of user and system processes. Number two, suspension and reactivation of processes. Number three, provision for a mechanism for process synchronization. Number four, provision of a mechanism for process communication. And number five, provision for a mechanism for deadlock handling. Simply put, Whenever we talk about process management as part of the operating system or as a function of the operating system, it is important to note that this includes all the activities and what relates to those activities in as, in as far as a program that is in execution is concerned. So whatever that uh, set of instructions that in execution require or make use of becomes part and the parcel of what is carried out by process manager under what we call the process management. I will discuss more details about process manager and the process management in the video on the process management. We write our computer programs in a text file 
And when we execute this program, it becomes a process which performs all the tasks mentioned in the program. When a program is loaded into the memory and it becomes a process, it can be embedded into four sections. That is stack, heap, text, and data. The other term which is related with the uh, operating systems is files. When you talk about a file, we are simply referring to an object on a computer that stores data, information, settings, or commands used with a computer program. It is created using a software program on the computer. For example, to create a text file, you would use a text editor. To create an image file, you would use an image editor. And to create a document, you would use a word processor. So computer files, once you have created your file, you have written in it the set of instructions and to like the computer to run, or you have stored in it something, you store it on a certain drive. It can be a hard disk, it can be a disk, like a DVD, a CD, or a diskette, and any other. And they may also be contained in a folder, or a directory, or a storage medium. So every file is specified. When you have stored certain information in a file, and you want to refer to that file, the operating system is able to refer to that file in two main ways, or what we call two types of path names. That is what we call the absolute path name and the relative path name. This is the ways of referring to the file or contents of a file. So an absolute path name, or when you're talking about absolute path name, this is a situation where every file within the directory hierarchy is specified by giving its full path name from the top of the directory hi hierarchy, or what they call it directory, to the file. In other words, you mention every path or that you need to pass through to access the file, starting with the storage medium, if it's hand disk, say the hand disk, then go to the main directory or storage location that contains all that information that relates to something, like for a certain school. Then inside that school, you have various um, functions that are performed there, like examinations, uh, students administration issues accommodation and all that so you go to that specific uh, folder or some folder that contains that function then you move on into that function you open that folder and from there you find other sub functions or sub activities and then finally you are able to reach the specific file that you are referring to so if you want to refer to a file by referring or including all the directories and subdirectories that must be traversed from the root directory to the file with the slashes separating the components that's what we call absolute path name. For example, C colon uh, backslash, evaluations backslash, exams backslash, and it back tells you, my dear student, that in this case, we are referring or we want to access a file that is called oh, as results. And this uh, file is a documented file that has been written using a one processor. The name of this file is OS results, but it is found in a subfolder or in a folder in a subfolder called end term exam, which is found in a large folder called exams, and the exams is located in a very large folder or storage location called evaluations, which is a part of a storage medium that is the hand disk. That is C colon referring to hand disk. So this entire part name, starting from the main directory, which is the storage medium all the way to where the file can be found and its type, that's what we call absolute path name. The leading slash indicates that the path is absolute. That is starting at the root directory. In this case, the root directory is the storage medium, like it, the one which you are presenting using C colon, this means it's on disk. If it was a CD drive or a, it was a compact disk on DVD, this one would be another letter like in D colon or even e colon if it was a flash disk it would also have another different letter now the other way of referring to a file is by the use of what we call a relative path name with the use of relative path name at every instant each process has a current working directory in which path names not the beginning with a slash are looked for therefore when we are using a relative path name we only refer to the current or working directory and the first name. So in the ab uh, absolute path name that we have looked at, we have found out that for you to be able to refer to this file that we are calling OS results, we had to pass from C colon all the way to uh, end term uh, 
subfolder sub or subdirectory in which OS results were located. But when we are using a path name, we just refer to the working directory. That is the directory or folder which contains our file. And in this case, our file, which is called OS results, is found in and the term exam. So that's what a relative path name is. You just refer to that working directory that contains your file. You just go directly to it. You don't need to traverse all the way the journey. A file system is thus normally organized into directories to make use of their use. In other words, if you have very many types of files and you want to store them in a storage medium, you need to subdivide the storage locations so that each storage location contains certain kind of information or certain type of files. So a storage location, a storage location where a file is found is what we are calling, referring to as a directory. So these directories may contain files and other directories. Every file system is made up of similar directories and subdirectories. Special files are provided in order to make input-output devices look like files. In other words, if you open your storage medium and you want it to look for a printer, what you are going to see is the name of the printer. That would be almost similar like any other file name. So when we have devices, these devices are also represented in the, operate, in the computer by the operating system as files. So we call them special files. That way, they can be read and written using the same system calls as used for reading and writing files. The two kinds of special files exist. These are block special files and the character special files. Block special files are used to model devices that consists of a collection of randomly addressable blocks, such as disks. So by opening a block special file and reading, for example, same block four, a program can directly access the fourth block on the device without regarding to the structure of the file system contained on it. Similarly, character special files are used to model printers, modems, and other devices that accept or output a character stream. By convention, the special files are kept in what we call a forward slash dev directory. Now, a pipe is a sort of um, pseudocode or pseudomain, pseudo file that can be used to connect the two processes. If process A and the process B wish to talk using a pipe, they must set it up in advance. When the process A wants to send data to process B, it writes on the pipe as though it were an output file. In fact, the implementation of a pipe is very much like that of a file. Process B can read the data by reading from the pipe as though it were an input file. Therefore, communication between the processes looks very much like ordinary file reads and the writes. The next term we are about to meet in the field of operating systems is what we call system calls. So what are system calls? This is the programmatic way in which a computer program requests a service from the kernel of the operating system it is executed on. This may include hardware related services, for example, accessing a hard disk drive, creation and execution of new processes, and the communication with the integral kernel services, such as process scheduling. So in other words, when you talk about a system call, a system call is a request, a request that is made, a request that is passed from an application program to the shell, that's a system call. It's a request making or that is expecting some certain kind of response. So there are various types of requests that can be made. And therefore, a request is a system call. System calls provide an essential interface between a process and the operating system. System calls provide an interface between the process and the operating system. So a process will make a request. That request will be passed to an operating system. So in this case, this request, yeah, it's very important because that is what creates a link between various components between the operating system and the process 
between the operating system and the hardware, ETC. System calls allow user level processes to request some services from the operating system, which processes itself or which process itself is not allowed to do. So this simply tells you, my dear students and listeners, that when you talk about system calls, there are those ones which are found at the user level and there are those which are found at the uh, uh, kernel level or the lower level. In handling the trap, so when you, a request is received, that request is trapped, it is held. The operating system, when it receives that kind of a request, it enters in the kernel mode, where it has access to privileged instructions and it can perform the desired service on the behalf of user level process. It is because of the critical nature of operations that the operating system itself does that makes them every time be needed. So it is because of the critical nature of operations that the operating system itself does on them that makes it important. Simply put, for the operating system to be able to understand what the application program is uh, requesting, a request must be generated by that application program, then it is received or trapped by a certain level like the shell of the operating system. And then that request is interpreted and the shell passes it to the kernel, which then is able to find out whether this request requires some resources. So for example, for input output, a process involves a system call telling the operating system to read or write particular area of the input device or the output device. And this request is satisfied by the operating system. So when a request is made, it is trapped, it is received, it is interpreted and the necessary action is taken by the operating system. System program programs provide basic functioning to users so that they do not need to write their own environment for program development and program execution. In some sense, the Arambados of useful system calls. When a user starts the system, the system is usually in the user mode. Remember, I've said user mode is that mode whereby the application program is able to interact with the shell, the outermost part of the operating system that is in charge of liaising with the application program to receive uh, requests. When he or she requests for a service, then the user mode is converted into the kernel mode. In other words, the instruction that has been received from the application program by the shell is then passed over to the kernel where we have what we call the kernel mode, which just listens to the request of the user and it processes that request and then displays the results that are produced after the processing. Remember I've said it is the kernel which is in charge of dealing or communicating directly with the hardware. So for this information to be displayed or the results of processing to be displayed, it simply means that a certain device that can display uh, um, the output must be available and it must be made ready. So it is the work of the kernel and the kernel mode to get in charge with the relevant hardware and the hardware receive the instruction and display what it's supposed to display. When a user make a request for opening any folder, or when he or she moves a mouse on the screen, then what he is using or she is using to perform this operation is a system call. The following diagram illustrates how a system call is provided. So when you look at this diagram, my dear student and the rest of the learners, you can see that we have user processes. User processes are those uh, processes that are directly related with the users or the users are the ones who are initiating a certain activity. Like for example, if you want to play a song, that program for playing a song, when it starts to play, that is a user process. So the user process, when it is executing, it will generate a certain call. That call becomes a system call. It is passed over to the kernel and the kernel will execute that system call and then it will return some feedback back to the user process that was making the request. So we move from the user mode where we have the users interacting with the shell through certain application programs. Then those application programs through the shell pass that information to the kernel level, which is then in charge of assigning uh, or activating various hardware 
And therefore, the kernel of Ubuntu receives the instructions, do what is required, and give back the feedback. So the user runs a program. When the program is running, it becomes a process. So the user is executing a process. When he or she is executing that process, he or she makes a certain request, like play a song. That request to play a song is passed over the kernel, which will then liaise with the relevant hardware for playing the song. If the hardware is available, it's not available, it will pass back the information to the user. If it's available, the song will be played and the listener will hear the song. If nothing is available, then the kernel will generate a certain error telling the user that what you are looking for is not available or this song cannot be played. Good. So the three general methods, the three general methods for passing parameters to the operating system are through the registers. When there are more parameters than registers, the parameters can be stored in a block, and then the block addresses can be passed as a parameter to a register. Number three, parameters can also be pushed on or popped off the stack by the operating system. The following diagram illustrates how a system call is made. So just as I have said, the user program, or when a person is making use of a certain program, this user will make a certain request to that program. And then the, the program or the request will be put in a form of um, address. Then that will be passed to a register. A register is a temporary storage location, of course, for the instructions that are on their way. And then that will be passed to the operating system in the form of a code. And the operating system will do the necessary. So there are five different categories of system calls. These are process control, file management, device management, information management, and the communications. So let's start with the process control. What are process control system calls? These are for managing processes. So anytime a process is running, a program is in execution. Any request that is going to make, those are referred to as the process control system calls. A running program needs to be able to stop execution either normally or abnormally. When execution is stopped abnormally, often a dump of memory is taken and can be examined with a debugger. Examples of such calls are load, execute, and about create process, terminate process, get or set process attributes, wait for time, event, signal event, allocate free memory. So those are some of the requests that can be made or the instructions that can be loaded. Instructions for loading, executing, ending a process, abutting a process, creating a process, terminating a process, getting or setting process attributes, waiting for certain time or event to happen, signal event, or even a request on allocating of free memory. File management system calls. These are calls that relate to handling of files and directories, as well as determining their attributes. Some common examples of system calls are create, for example, create a file, delete a file, remove a file, read a file, write to a file, reposition the contents of a file, or close, get, and set the file attribute. Therefore, create, delete, remove, read, write, reposition, close, get, set. These are some of the activities that can be carried out. So those are some of the instructions that can be issued in relation to files. When it comes to devices, we have what we call device management system calls. These are the calls that are made by a process requiring resources to execute. If these resources are available, they will be granted and the control returned to the user process. These resources are also thought of as devices. Some are physical, such as a video card, and others are abstract, such as a file. So some examples of these types of calls that can be made are requests for devices, releasing device, read, write, reposition, set device attributes, logically attached device, detached device, among others. 
The other type of system calls that we can have are what we call the information management system calls. These are a system calls that exist purely for transferring information between the user program and the operating system. Examples of these calls are set time, date, get system data, amongst others. And the fifth category of system calls are those ones for communications. These are a system calls that are used to handle translation and reception of information. They include recreate, delete communication connection, send or receive messages, transfer status information, attach or detach remote devices. Then the other tab we are bound to find in the flow of operating systems is what we call the virtual machines or VM. A virtual machine is an emulation of a particular computer system environment that behaves as if it is a separate computer. It is an operating system or application environment that is installed on software which imitates dedicated hardware. The end user has the same experience as the same experience on virtual machines as they would have in a dedicated hardware. Virtual machines operate based on the computer architecture and functions of a real or hypothetical computer. And their implementations may involve specialized hardware, software, or a combination of both. Specialized software called hypervisor emulates the PC client, PC stands for personal computer client, or servers, CPU, that is central processing unit, memory, hard disk, network, and other hardware resources, completely enabling virtual machines to share the resources. The hypervisor can emulate multiple virtual hardware platforms that are isolated from each other, allowing virtual machines to run various operating systems on the same underlying physical host. Virtualization limits costs by reducing the need for physical hardware which lowers the quantities of hardware and associated maintenance costs and reduces power and cooling demand. Virtual machines operate based on the computer architecture and functions of a real or hypothetical computer, and the implementations may involve specialized hardware, software, or a combination of both. Specialized software, which is called a hypervisor, emulates the PC client or server CPU, just as I have said, a memory, hard disk, network, and other hardware resources completely enabling uh, virtual machines to share the resources. The hypervisor can emulate multiple virtual hardware platforms that are isolated from each other, allowing virtual machines to run various OS on the same underlying physical host. Virtualization limits costs by reducing the need for physical hardware, which lowers the quantities of hardware and associated maintenance costs and it also reduces the power and the cooling demand. They also ease management because virtual hardware does not fail. Administrators can take advantage of virtual environments to simplify backups, disaster recovery, new deployments, and basic system administration tasks. Virtual machines do not require specialized hypervisor-specific hardware. Visualization is a technology that allows a single computer to host multiple virtual machines each potentially running a different operating system. So the advantages of virtualization include, number one, a failure in one virtual machine does not automatically bring down any others. Number two, check pointing and migrating virtual machines is much easier than migrating processes running on a normal operating system. Number three, it allows legacy applications to be installed on operating systems, that is operating system versions, which no longer support or which do not work on current hardware. Virtual machines uh, approach also um, allows a programmer who wants to make sure that his or her software works on any OS um, no longer need not to get a dozen computers and install different operating systems on all of them so that it knows whether the program will function or not. So that's why you are saying that in software development, a programmer, a programmer who wants to make sure his software works on any OS no longer has to get a dozen computers and install different operating systems on all of them. 
virtual machines allow one or more actual CPUs to provide the illusion that there are more CPUs than there really are. In this way, it is possible to run multiple operating systems or multiple in compatible versions of the same operating system at the same time on the same piece of hardware. So what are the characteristics of operating systems? The following are the key characteristics of operating systems. Number one, memory management. Operating systems keep track of primary memory, that is, which part of it is in use by whom, what part is not in use, etc., and it also allocates the memory when a process or a program requests for it. Secondly, uh, operating systems, uh, second characteristic is processor management. In this case, the operating system allocates the processor or CPU to a process and then deallocates the processor when it is no longer required or when the process no longer requires it. Number three, device management. The operating system keeps track of all devices. This is also called input-output controller that decides which process gets the device, when, and for how much time. Number four, file management. The operating system allocates and deallocates the resources and decides who gets which resource at what time. Number five, security. The operating system prevents unauthorized access to programs and data by means of passwords and similar other techniques that we are going to learn in some other videos. Number six, job accounting. The operating system keeps track of time and resources used by various jobs and or users. Number seven, we have control over system performance. The operating system records delays between requests for service and from the system. Number nine or number eight is interaction with the operators. The interaction may take place via the console of the computer in the form of instructions. So the operating system acknowledges the same, thus the corresponding action and informs the operation by a display screen. The other characteristic is error detecting. Is. Now the operating system ensures that this production of dumps, traces, error messages, and other debugging and error detecting methods. And the last one is coordination between other software and users. So coordination and assignment of compilers, interpreters, assemblers, and other software to the various users of the computer systems is done by the operating systems. So what are the objectives or the goals of an operating system? So the following are the main objectives of the operating systems. Number one, to make a computer system convenient to use in an efficient manner. Number two, to hide the details of the hardware resources from the users. Number three, to provide the users a convenient interface to use the computer system. Number four, to act as an intermediary between the hardware and its users and making it easier for the users to access and use other resources. Number five, to manage the resources of a computer system. Number six, to keep track of who is using which resource granting the resource requests according uh, for resource using and mediating conflicting requests from different programs and users. Number seven is to provide the efficient or providing efficient and fair sharing of resources among the users and other programs. So what are the functions of operating systems? Now an operating system basically performs two major independent tasks or functions. These are resource management, and number two, provision of a virtual machine or emulation of a virtual machine. So what do we uh, refer to as resource management? Just as I have seen from the beginning of this presentation is that the operating systems works as a resource manager to manage the resources efficiently in a computer, such as processor, memory, input output devices, and others. So the modern computers consist of various uh, resources such as processors, memory, clocks, records, monitors, network interfaces, printers, and other devices or resources that can be used by multiple users simultaneously. So the work of operating system is to direct and control the allocation of the resources generally 
to various programs that are using it. So the operating systems has to decide about which resources are used by which running programs, and the operating system also makes a decision on how to administer them. So when the operating system is making a decision about which resources are going to be used by which running programs and how they are going to be administered, that is what we are calling resource management. So the operating system assigns the computer resources to processes for an efficient use. Therefore, the operating system plays an important role as a resource manager while ensuring the user satisfaction. To manage the computer resources most effectively, the operating system decides which program should run at what time, how much memory should be allocated for an executing program, where to save the file so that the disk space can be optimally utilized among other activities. So the following are some of the most important services that are performed by the operating system as a resource manager. Number one, process management. That is, it handles all the issues to do with the processes. Number two, memory management. It handles all issues to do with the use of memory. Then file management. This concerns all issues that are pertains to um, files or data stored in a certain location. Input, output device management. So it deals with all issues to do with the input and output devices. Secondary storage management. This concerns all matters pertaining to the use of secondary storage medium. Then network management. This concerns all matters pertaining to the interconnections between devices. Then protection, or what you call user authentication, that is ensuring that there is adequate security to the data and the programs that are stored within a computer. It also does what we call the command interpreter system, that is receiving various instructions, interpreting those instructions, and taking the necessary actions. So let's look at each of them in beginning process management. So in most processing environment, operating system allows more than one application or a process to run simultaneously. So process management is a part of an operating system which manages the processes in such a way that system performance can be enhanced. These resources are allocated to the processes and based on decision that which process should be assigned for the allocation of a resource and this decision is taken by process management, implementing the process scaling and rewardings. Number two, memory management. This is the most important part of an operating system that it deals directly with both the primary, or what we call the main memory, and the secondary memory. The main memory is a large array of bytes, and each byte has its own address. Main memory provides the storage for a program that can be accessed directly by the CPU for its execution. So for a program to be executed, the primary task of memory management is to load the program into main memory. The third function or work is file management. While working on the computer, generally, a user is required to manipulate various types of files, like opening a file, saving a file, and deleting a file from the storage disk. This is an important task that is also performed by the operating system. So the operating system makes it easier for the user programs to accomplish their task by providing the file system manipulation service. Number four, input output and device management. Input output and device management is also a part of an operating system that it provides an environment for the better interaction between the system and the input output and devices, such as printers, scanners, tape drives, and others. So each program requires an input, and after processing the input submitted by the user, it produces output. This involves the use of input-output devices. So the operating system hides the user from all these details of underlying hardware for the input-output. And therefore, the operating system makes the users convenient to run the programs by providing input-output functions. Number five, secondary storage management. Now, the secondary storage management provides an easy access to the file and the folders placed on secondary storage using several disk scaling algorithms. We are going to learn, my dear students, about uh, scaling algorithms in another video on process management. So the four major activities of an operating system in regard to secondary storage management are managing the free space available on the secondary storage device, 
allocation of storage space where new files have to be written, scheduling the requests for memory access, and the creation and deletion of files. Number six, network management. An operating system works as a network resource manager when multiple computers are in a network or in a distributed architecture. Number seven, protection or user authentication. Now, protection is that ability to authenticate the users for an illegal access of data as well as system. So the operating system provides media services for data and system security by the means of use of passwords, file permissions, and data encryption. If a computer system has multiple users and allows the concurrent execution of multiple processes, then the various processes must be protected from one another's activities. Protection in this case refers to that mechanism for controlling the access of programs, processes, or users to the resources defined by a computer system. Then we have command interpreter system. A command interpreter is an interface of the operating system with the user. The user gives commands which are executed by the operating system, usually by turning them into system calls. Remember I've said, when we talk about a system call, we are simply referring to requests. So there are those requests which are made by a user. There are those requests which are made by a program like application programs. There are also requests that are made by the system uh, software. So the main function of a command interpreter is to get and execute the user specified command. So the second major function of operating systems is provision of a virtual machine. So what do we mean by provision of a virtual machine? Simply, this is a situation whereby the operating system hides the complexities of how the hardware and software operates from the user so that the user interacts with the hardware as a very simple device at a very simple level. And therefore, a virtual machine is an interface that is provided by the operating system to its users that is more convenient to use than the bare machine. It makes a computer system convenient and of course easy for the users to use. Therefore, the operating system is a layer of software on top of the bare hardware of a computer system, which manages all the parts of the system and presents the user with an interface, which is very easy to program and to use. So by providing this simple and easy to use interface, the operating system hides the details and the complexities of the hardware resources from the programmer or from the user, that is what we call abstracting, and it provides the programmer with a convenient interface for using the computer system. Real processors, memories, disks, and other devices are very complicated and they present difficult, awkward, and idiosyncratic and inconsistent interfaces to the people who have to write software to use them. So sometimes this is due to the need for backward compatibility with the older hardware, sometimes due to a desire to save money, but sometimes the hardware designers do not realize or care how much trouble they are causing for the software. One of the major tasks of the operating systems is therefore to hide the way the hardware works and the program works so as to present a very nice clean, elegant, consistent abstractions, abstractions to work with in stage. And therefore, one of the major tasks of the operating system is to hide the hardware and present programs and their programmers with a nice, clean, elegant, consistent, simple to use uh, level. With the provision of the virtual machine, programmers do not need to worry about the programming of hard drives and the rest of the hardware because the operating system provides for a simple high level abstraction. Operating system ab abstracts the material and the programmer and it provides a simple and a pleasant view files, a pointed that can be read and written. When you talk about abstracting, we are simply saying that the operating system hides unnecessary details from the programmer 
that is details concerning the hardware and how the hardware is working from below. An operating system transforms the physical world of devices, instructions, memory, and time into virtual world. That is the result of abstractions built by the operating system. So the following are some reasons for abstraction. In other words, the following are some of the reasons as, as to why the operating system hides the complexities of the hardware and uh, how the hardware functions or is working during uh, a certain or computer operation or use. Number one, the code needed to control peripheral devices is not standardized. Operating systems provide some routines that we call device drivers that perform operations on behalf of programs, for example, input or output operations. Number two, the operating system introduces new functions as it abstracts the hardware. For instance, the operating system introduces the file abstraction so that programs do not have to deal with the disks. Number three, the operating system transforms the computer hardware into multiple virtual computers, each belonging to a different program. Each program that is running is called a process. So each process uses the hardware through the lens of abstraction. The operating system also can enforce security through abstraction. So my dear students, with that, we have come to the end of the part one on introduction to operating systems. For you to be able to understand more about the operating systems, proceed to watch my second video, which is introduction to operating systems, part two, in which I have covered the following uh, topics or subtopics in relation to introduction to operating systems. Number one, evolution of operating systems, where I've explained how operating systems evolved or the history of operating systems, the operating system structures, a subtopic or a topic which explains in depth how the operating systems are coded by programmers. Number three, the types of operating systems that uh, exist in the field of ICT or computers. Number four, job control. And number five, installation of operating systems. Thank you, therefore, for going through this topic on fundamentals of operating systems or introduction to operating systems. This video continues to part two, which is called Introduction to Operating Systems Part Two. This video is posted in MLSWAP ICT YouTube channel. So you can access the, this video and other ICT or computer videos by searching for this YouTube channel in YouTube. In addition to access life skills, motivational and inspirational videos, search for the YouTube channel by the name MLSWAP Enterprises International. You can subscribe to the two YouTube channels by clicking on subscribe button just next to the name of the channel if it currently reads subscribe so that it becomes subscribed. However, if it already reads as subscribed, don't click on it because that means that you have already subscribed to the two channels and you are already a member of the channels. So in case you need any additional correspondence or in case you like to communicate with us for any clarification or any comments concerning uh, our various videos and presentations, you can write it to us through the email mlswap at gmail.com. Be blessed and God bless you as you continue pursuing your knowledge to greater heights through MLSWAP ICT channel. Thanks.